now to a new book full of old ideas that it's hoped will resonate with new readers, particularly those in leadership and public policy positions. It's called Leading from the Streets, a compilation of articles written and published by the author Magnus Onyibe between 1999 and 2019, cutting across the entire spectrum of Nigeria's socio-economic and political life and containing a mix of sound advice and good old fashioned common sense and much of it still valid in today's Nigeria. For instance, an article written in 2002 on the need to deregulate the police force which, if it had been implemented, might have helped to reduce the current level of insecurity in Nigeria. And another one on the dangers of budget padding at the National Assembly and so on. The book was recently launched in Lagos with the likes of the former head of state, Yakubu Gawan, in attendance. So if this new godfather of country help had been listened to, might it have possibly helped Nigeria recover a little more quickly from its downward spiral? Well, for more about the book and the book launch, and the idea behind all of that. I'm joined from our studios in Lagos by the author, media columnist, democracy advocate, and former two-time commissioner in Delta State, who of course wrote that book, Magnus Onyibe. Magnus, thank you very much indeed. Uh, congratulations. It's not easy, is it? Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Although, although some would argue that it is fairly easy, because you, you put together the articles that you'd already written. But they're, they're very significant, aren't they, those articles? Yes, they are. You know, they are old articles that I've written um, um, before 1999, in fact. It dates back uh, beyond 1999. Um, I wrote them not uh, believing or having in mind or even imagining that some of the things we discussed at that time would still be relevant today. But... Most of them are resonating, you know, so, uh, so much has changed and not much has changed, unfortunately. That's a really good way to put it. And, and I expect that a lot of people would agree with that. But let's, we're talking about you and the insights that you had um, to kind of write those articles when you did. I mean, at some point, I suppose, you started getting more cynical about leadership in this country. And then there was a sort of journey from, I presume, cynicism to sincerity when you realized that cynicism isn't mm -hmm. going to be enough and that you had to help the country move Absolutely. beyond the corniness of, of, of its leaders. And, and that's how you kind of, I mean, I'm presuming that's how you got into doing this. You're spot on. You're quite spot on. I am uh, an advocate. I am not uh, a critic. I look at issues and uh, I look at the best ways to which we can solve the problems or challenges that we face. And uh, each administration faces different challenges. As you mentioned, um, the idea of uh, state police or community police was introduced was first booted, actually, by uh, President Lucio Guo Obasanjo from 1999. As a matter of fact, his Minister of Information, Dr. Sharubi, actually mentioned that uh, steps were being taken to have the street police introduced. But there were differences between uh, the national and sub-national leaders. Some uh, state governors felt they were not uh, ready for it. They were not going to be able to afford to pay the salaries or take care of the other um, costs. And they, they demurred, they shied away from it, and uh, things got uh, bad from then. You can imagine if they had accepted at that time, local police would be like um, the sheriff in the, the U.S., for instance. Sheriffs live amongst the people, and they know the people, the people know them. When a new person gets into the community, the sheriff finds who that person is, because he knows everybody there. And he goes to that person and says, look, we don't mess around here, so you better be careful, I'm watching you. And uh, so if uh, a, a similar situation uh, were to um, hold in Nigeria, that there were state police or uh, um, police in the community, from the community, they would be able to identify troublemakers and uh, they would be nipped in the board. The kind of insurgency and the challenges 
that we have right now with respect to banditry would not have occurred, perhaps. Well, absolutely. Uh, and that's an argument that is uh, going on, debate, I should call it, that's going on in Nigeria at the moment. But you also wrote another very interesting article on budget padding, which is contained in the book. Um, and I was talking with you earlier and you were suggesting that it might be a good idea for legislators to have a way of delivering dividends of democracy to the people because obviously making laws i mean in your village may, might not be seen as a dividend of of democracy um but uh, that Absolutely. i mean the, but the others raise the question that if you allow that to happen that is going to actually make lawmakers more not less corrupt no it, it, it's not going to make them more corrupt because i think that um we have peculiarities in Nigeria, for instance. We are practicing the presidential system of government. And uh, basically, um, the executive uh, delivers dividends of democracy, and uh, the legislature delivers uh, mixed laws. You know, but unfortunately, um, in Nigeria, because maybe debt of dividends of democracy, because of where we're coming from, we're coming from street lack, nothing there, you know, from something that looks like a desert. So people are waiting for um, things that will change their life from their leaders. And uh, the way the presidential system is, uh, is wired, it's only the executive that can deliver dividends of democracy. And uh, the legislators are just content or should be content with making laws. But both the executives and the members of the legislature actually go out to campaign. They mount the rostrum and tell the people that they're going to do this, they're going to do that. And at the end of the day, the legislators don't get to do that because that's not their role. It's the role of the executive. Now, they begin to feel like they have to do something. So they start uh, doing something by padding budgets. When the budget gets to them, they try to put in something. They found a name for it, constituency projects, you know, which is actually really, you know, uh, you know not uh, quite legal, you know, not uh, quite constitutional. So, and this has been going on right from the days of President Obasanjo, 1999. When he complained about budget pardon, he was present with impeachment because uh, we had just started the process of democracy at that time. So impeachment was, uh, you know, always a, a big uh, weapon that uh, is wielded each time the executive arm, you know, uh, misbehaves or uh, tend to be seen as having misbehaved. And, uh, you know, subsequently, you know, when uh, Yaradwa took over, he went through the same experience. Jonathan suffered the same fate. President Buhari experienced it in 2018. You know, so I wrote about it, you know, and uh, it has continued. So if this process has continued, this budget padding issue has continued to be up till now, and it's still really said, um, you know, during the last uh, budget session, and uh, President Tinubu had to explain that uh, he's an accountant, so there was nothing, you know, untoward about what had happened. You begin to imagine that there's actually need for these legislators who have been finding one way or the other to put in something that they can deliver to their constituency. And there's need for it because it's a recurring decimal. So if there's need for it, why not legitimize it? Make it legitimate because they're just about to review the constitution. Somebody will say, okay, fine, that's not you know, how the presidential system is wired. You know, we are also saying, some, some people are saying, okay, are we going to do the presidential or the legislative uh, or, or, the, or, or the, um, the parliamentary system? But some people are saying, let's do a hybrid. There are countries practicing hybrid, for instance. France, for instance, is practicing constitutional democracy. The same thing has Ghana to some extent. So we can find a way to accommodate ourselves so that we can do legal things. As far as I'm concerned, and I think to the, to the best of my knowledge, and uh, a lot of people have uh, actually um, confirmed this, constituent project, constituency project is actually an aberration of sorts. So why don't we find a way to make sure that we accommodate legislators, that they are able to also give their people that they made promises to dividends of democracy. Somebody is saying to me, as you just pointed out, that they will, the legislature will become more corrupt. I say no, because these projects will be tagged to them. It will be in the budget, it will be clear that 
for instance, I come from Delta State and from Delta North, and my senator is Ned Umoko. If some school projects, water projects, or whatever projects is allocated to my place, and is, is stated that it is the responsibility of Ned Umoko, who is awarding the contract, or who supervises the award of the contract, or who knows about the contract, and at the end of the period, those projects are not there. We will hold his feet to the fire. Well, to be honest, explain, yeah, to, you know, to, it will to, get to, people more more involved. Yeah, I understand what you mean. I mean, there, there is, there, I mean, there, there are bits of it that make sense, but the other part of it is the the bit about budget padding. I mean, I, I don't see how that's going to stop budget padding because I mean they'll simply pad out the, <laughs> the projects they put in the in the, in the, the budget and say that it's going to cost cost you know 100 million naira when it would have cost 50 million naira but i mean when policy makers because i was looking at the pictures from your book launch there and i mean let's face it the who's mm. who in nigeria were there mm. um I don't know if active members of government were there, but certainly, I mean, former governors, former heads of state, ministers, all the rest of it, former ministers were all there. I mean, I wonder when policymakers read a country help book like yours, is there that element that this is all stuff that we already knew and it's just that someone has put it into a crystallized form i mean i'm not trying to do you out of your considerable work here but why is it that we need to put this into a book rather than letting common sense prevail i mean there are things you've already written the, i mean these are things you've already written about publicly is there something about seeing them afresh in a book absolutely you know first of all out of over a thousand articles that I've written since 1999, we selected 77 of them and put them in seven chapters. Uh, these chapters are, uh, de deal with um, different segments of society, from politics to religion. Okay, and each of these chapters has afterward writer. The afterward writer is somebody uh, that is contemporary and uh, has knowledge about the area focused on in that chapter. And, you know, so that person validates or invalidates what I had written maybe 20 years ago or 22 years ago. It brings in fresh perspective, fresh energy. And now, the reason for putting all this together in a tone actually was captured by the chief of staff to the president, uh, Right Honorable Femi Kwajabe Amila, in a letter that he wrote to us. He couldn't come because of uh, the assignment that he had uh, in Abuja. He wanted to send a representative. Uh, unfortunately, the letter didn't get to us on time, so we didn't give him a go-ahead. We invited practically all the governors in Nigeria. We invited most of the legislators. I sent them copies of the book through logistic firms, GIG, free of charge. None of them showed up. Reason being that, you know, somebody said, you know, that if you want to hide, it, hide something from the black man, put it in the book. You know, but I don't believe in that because I don't have evidence to show that. So I decided I was going to send the book to everybody. This book is a compilation of everything. And when people went, want to learn from the mistakes of the past, they either go to the library or go through so many books. But everything is compiled in a tome, in one single book. That is what the chief of staff recognized. And I was really impressed that he did that. So that people, just, you just have one book where you find all the mistakes that past leaders have made, and you learn from those things. You avoid the banana peels so that you can go ahead. Because if you don't learn from the past, how can you move forward? So I expected, you know, that uh, the head of state, Jiran Gawan, having been in government himself, made a strong recommendation. He went through it. He said, look, anybody who wants to be in leadership now or in the future has to read this book because there are nuggets of wisdom in it. There, News of yesterday is history of tomorrow, okay? So these were news. What is contained in this tome, in this book, were news items of 22 years ago, 24 years ago. Today, they are historical because things that President Obasanjo did, for instance, in 1999, is historical. But when right. I was writing these articles, they were news items. They were current affairs. I understand you know, right that. right now, they are historical. So they are kept in this storage for people to have easy reference from right. one book. 
Well, let, let's so uh, it, we, it we, says we, something it, it, it's, it's quite innovative and different. Right, I understand what you mean. Uh, let's talk. I mean, we've got just a couple of minutes, uh, two minutes or so left. Unfortunately, we're running mm -hmm. out of time. Let's talk mm -hmm. about the title. Mm. Leading from the streets, media interventions by a media intellectual, which seems a rather self-focused title at first glance. I mean, you refer to yourself as a media intellectual. What was the idea behind that? Yes, media intellectualism actually is a coinage of uh, Joseph, of uh, Rosel Jacobi. He coined it in uh, 1987. And it's about intellectuals who think for the public. They, they don't rely on theory alone. They come into the street and put it in practice. A typical example is uh, somebody that uh, was on not long ago, uh, Dr. Sam Amadi. He's a public intellectual. He's always in the media analyzing you know, uh, issues, policies. Another person that comes to mind is uh, Professor Bolaji Akinyemi. He's an intellectual, he's a specialist, but he's always in the media trying to interpret policies and programs and trying to do critical thinking for society. So a public intellectual is somebody who takes intellectualism out of the classroom, out of the lab, into the streets. Well, I mean, we, we know what... And we, 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 is to thinking and theories you. I mean, to the public. We, we know what, in, what an intellectual yeah, okay. is. The, the question is you referring mm. to yourself as... It, I mean, it's, if, if Sam Amadi writes a book... Or, or Professor Bologna and says, yes. you know, I'm an intellectual yes. and I'm sort of into, I mean, it, it, it kind of looks a little mm. bit, you see what I mean? So it's, it's not the issue of whether it, the book yes. contains intellectual nuggets of wisdom. It is the fact that you're referring to yourself mm. as an intellectual. You're labeling yourself an intellectual. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? That's, that's yes, the, people that's the who issue. do the kind of things that I do, Yes, so people who do the kind of things that I do are public intellectuals. I just told you who coined it. And if there was no yeah. role for them, if there were no people identified as such, it would not be coined. So you are probably not aware of it because it's not a mainstream. <laughs> but people who intellectualize issues and take it to the public and apply it are public intellectuals. And that's the function, or that's the role I just played in putting this book together. Well, I mean, I, 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 I uh, congratulate you for putting the book together. And uh, I, I think Thank it's a you. very interesting uh, book. And, and some of the articles there I would certainly recommend to people who are policy makers in this country. But I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank and I want much. to thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, from our studios in Lagos, the author, media columnist, democracy advocate, former two-time commissioner in Delta State, and now, of course, a media intellectual, Magnus Oyibe. Thank you very much indeed. That's it for this edition of Arise Prime Time. Join us again tomorrow. From me and the entire team here in Abuja and Lagos, bye-bye and thank you for watching.